Hi, everyone. Uh, here's the second part of the uh, Maxent lecture. I um, put this offset slash sampling bias section um, in with the, uh, the component on uh, demo in R just because I was rambling too long on the last one and I, don't know, I ran out of words or something. So, okay, so picking up where we left off, this is another component of um, choosing Maxent models or setting up your Maxent models. And um, you might remember this from before, uh, our predicted relative occurrence rate as a function of environmental covariates uh, is related to the environmental covariate vector times the coefficients, some constant that makes this relative occurrence rate that sums to one. And then there was this part about the prior that uh, we skipped. And so in the, um, the first part, we discussed how uh, the maxent assumption is that we are assuming something, uh, we are assuming a priori that the species is equally likely to be everywhere, which means that our prior best guess corresponds to um, a uniform function across geographic space. And so that means that this function Q here is just a constant. And so it doesn't actually affect our predictions. But there might be reasons that we want to uh, capture variation in different a priori assumptions. Um, so, um, for example, sampling bias. So if you uh, sample the, lo the locations on the landscape, landscape non-randomly, you may have uh, sampling bias. Uh, so this would mean that um, all locations with high temperatures were not as likely to be sampled as locations with low temperatures, and that could influence um, your inference because you may have a biased sample of presences if, if the species also occurred. So, at high temperatures. Um, and so I think this doesn't get as much attention as it perhaps should in the literature. I would say that sampling bias is probably the second most important influence um, on your model prediction right after the locations of presences um, that determine your prediction. So to see this, um, note that um, with presence only data, we don't necessarily know where someone sampled, okay? So with presence absence data, you can say, we went there, we didn't see it, and that tells you where you sampled. With presence only data, particularly, you know, opportunistically collected off of uh, the internet, uh, we don't know which locations people were looking for red maples uh, across the North America. Uh, we just know where they found them. And so the relationship, what we'd like to know is a relative probability of presence. But what we've got, what we can estimate, is the probability that a presence was recorded. And that's different from the probability of presence because um, it's the product of the probability that a location was sampled times the probability, the relative probability of presence there. Um, so let's say um, a location were, um, actually, I'm gonna go improve this slide, I'll be right back. Okay, couldn't find what I was looking for, so we're just gonna go with it. Um, so let's say you have twice as many samples in uh, one region as another. Uh, without knowing something about sampling effort, you don't know whether having twice as many samples is because the species is twice as abundant there or because there was twice as much sampling effort there. And those two things are, are fundamentally confounded with one another. And so, uh-oh, now the cats are fighting. This is, a, this is an adventure. Um, so ultimately, we can decompose this probability that a presence was recorded into the probability that you sampled a particular location and uh, the probability that it was present. We can further uh, decompose this uh, into saying that sampling is related to um, whether or uh, you went to a location or not and how likely your probability of detection is um, if it were there. So probability of detection could be related to how long you spend in that particular location uh, looking for something. It could depend on the quality of the uh, observer. It could have been a lot of different things. Um, unfortunately, we don't typically know enough information about these two to decompose them, so they end up being wrapped up in this, this probability of sampling. And so ultimately what we need to do is um, account for the sampling so that we can get at this true probability of presence. So the way that we do that, um, Oh, and I guess the other point is that um, usually we just have this because if we could estimate detection, we'd probably use an occupancy model that uses repeated samples over time. 
Okay, so um, starting from this point here, uh, this is the same expression that we saw previously. Um, we're going to look at the factor bias out algorithm, as the accent literature called this um, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, so we've got our probability of a recorded presence being related to the probability that we sampled, the probability that it's present. We can just divide this guy over to the other side, and that gives us that, that true uh, relative probability of presence that we want. And um, by looking at the solution that we discussed uh, in the previous lecture for the predicted distribution, you can see that the, sam the sampling model, or, the, or what will become the sampling model, our prior distribution, um, ends up right out front over here. So the really nice thing about that is that if we simply supply this sampling model to MaxN, uh, I'll talk about operationally how to do that in a moment, supply a sampling model, we can essentially fit the coefficients and then divide the predicted values that we get by the sampling model at those locations. And that corresponds to this step up here. And so that allows us to um, factor out sampling bias. So um, how do we supply uh, sampling? Now there's a couple different ways. I haven't gone into the detail on the, um, for the graphical, the GUI interface, the point and click interface from Accent because I haven't used it in a long time. Um, but there is an option to provide a sampling bias surface uh, to it. So you basically make a raster that describes the relative probability of sampling in different locations across a landscape. Um, the way that I tend to do it nowadays is because I use um, weighted GLMs to fit my Maxent models. Uh, this sampling model just enters as an offset uh, into the model. And so we can simply uh, build a model for sampling. So that may use uh, your knowledge of, um, so in this case, this was New England, and we used a model that was um, jointly related between population density and uh, road density. And so you can see that places with lots of roads kind of show up on here with the idea that uh, a priori, the only reason that we observed the species was because somebody looked there. So when you account, you know, the maxent assumption under sampling bias changes from a priori, we expect the species to be equally likely everywhere, to becoming, we expect the species to equally likely to be everywhere, and therefore it only occurs in places that we looked. And so uh, what that relates to in terms of a, um, a spatial surface is if you build a sampling model, we are trying to fit a model that stays as close to this sampling model as possible, that's the maximum entropy assumption, as close to this mos uh, model as possible and uh, deviates only to the extent that the data forces it to. And so we can build this guy, it could be a regression of, um, a target group uh, on uh, anthropogenic factors that describe uh, how likely somebody is to sample there. Uh, you can generate it in a lot of different ways. Uh, I've, there's both a paper by Stephen Phillips in 2009, I believe in ecology, uh, that talks about a couple options for doing this. I have a paper in 2016 in GEB that describes doing this in a couple different ways. But basically, you just get to put it in as an offset. And that's a pretty um, convenient way to do it. Um, notably, uh, if you, it, folks have probably heard about target group background, and that's, on, that's the idea where you say, well, I don't know where somebody looked, but let's say I want to study maples, or let's say I want to study red maples, I'll make the assumption that anybody who recorded a maple would have recorded a red maple had it been there. Uh, and that's a, you know, pretty significant assumption. Um, you know, maybe for birding groups that do surveys, it's a pretty decent assumption. Um, you know, for other uh, rare taxa, probably it's not as good of an assumption because people are more likely to be looking for a specific rare taxa. Um, but basically the idea is that the um, target group corresponds to using an offset that is uh, a constant at locations that were sampled by other members of your target group, other maples, and a zero where, um, where, it, it, um, where there were no samples. And so what that does is it just simplifies this prior distribution or your sampling model into a binary one zero that just says, let's only draw background points from other locations that were sampled. Um, this is something that uh, I'm not gonna talk through in detail, but it's a reference for you to look back at or pause the video. Um, when you factor bias out, it's possible because you're doing a division here where you're estimated, you're dividing by some sampling probability, it, in this case, Q. Um, 
if that happens to be a small number because there's very low sampling, that can in, uh, increase the value of your predicted distribution to a very high value. And the counterintuitive result of that is that you end up predicting that the species is mo most likely to occur at locations that are barely sampled. So um, that's kind of a problem. Uh, this is detailed in the appendix of my 2013 paper, um, or maybe you could just kind of get it from looking at the, the figures here. But basically what happens is if there's very low sampling, um, we can actually end up with the locations uh, where we initially estimated the probability to be low to end up being the highest predictions of any of the locations on a landscape. And so uh, basically what that means is that you need to filter out background points where little to no sampling occurred uh, because it will, it will simply sort of have this artifactual inflation. Um, and so here's an example of how we, um, how we can do this. So if we use a, a uniform offset, this is kind of the traditional maxent way, uh, and here are presence locations uh, of two different types across the landscape. Uh, the black and the gray dots are just different data sources. And if we also um, compare that to a model in which we use this anthropogenic-based offset to say that um, samples are most likely to come from places that have lots of people or lots of roads, uh, you can see that we get a fairly different prediction where um, this is an invasive species uh, that can actually potentially has suitable habitat further north than we would have um, expected otherwise. So it can have pretty significant um, uh, implications on your predictions. And this is all detailed in this 2016 paper where I work through this example. Um, a different way of using these offsets is to incorporate other types of information uh, that are from other data sources. So uh, one way to do this is to consider a priori that you uh, you do know something about where the species occurs. For example, you may have an expert map where an expert said, here are some polygons that describe where I think this thing occurs. So your best guess a priori is that the expert's right, and so you may want to maximize similarity to uh, this expert map. And there could be you know, uh, information on land use or elevation bands or habitat types, any, any number of other things. Um, basically, this is kind of a, a simplified hack at a, at a hierarchical model. Um, that's that's a bit easier to implement. And so uh, I wrote a paper on this using expert maps. Um, and it, oh, a, a little side note here. We don't actually factor out the offset from this part because an expert map is a piece of information. It's not a piece of confounding information. So we actually don't do that division step. Um, and I mentioned previously for sampling bias. And so uh, what you can see the effect of this is, um, here's a typical Maxent model here. And if we zoom in um, to this little particular area of the Andes, what you can see is here are the presence locations, here's the expert map. And you can see there's kind of some diffuse predictions out here, little yellow areas. Um, when you incorporate the expert map, what it does is it kind of tightens up the, the predictions around the edges and it says, well, if we're using both of these bits of information, let's, let's assume the expert's pretty reasonable. And so, you know, we have some points outside the expert map right here. So it's okay that we have predictions outside the expert map, but they're not, as far away as you know, a separate um, separate region over here. Um, so, in summary, um, and this is to summarize the you know the first part of the talk as well, which I broke up here. Um, Maxent is just a principle for parsimony for choosing probability distributions. Um, I think for most people familiar with regressions, it's easier to think about them in terms of point process models than the actual you know maximizing entropy and Lagrange multipliers and so forth. Um, but that's up to you, you nothing wrong with either way. Um, the point process approach reduces background selection to just choosing a sensible domain. And so you need to choose a domain that reflects um, suitable and unsuitable habitat um, relative to the processes that you're interested in. Uh, talked about regularization and how to choose that. And I think the, the most appropriate way to do that, which is kind of the standard in, in machine learning is through cross validation. Uh, and that needs to be something that, you know, we as a, as a, field, um, do a better job of. And, uh, and then I guess the last point to make is that sampling bias is um, an important part of distribution models that I think probably everybody knows that, but they don't necessarily do something about it, um, which includes myself in that category sometimes. And so it's, it's really important that we start thinking about different ways to, to model and sampling bias and, and account for it in some way, or at least in your, in your papers, argue why it's not important for your particular taxonomy region. Okay, so this is part two, um, and this is uh, 
just some thoughts on implementing Maxent in R. It's not necessarily a full demo, but it gives you a little spectrum of the different ways that you can do it. Um, there's quite a few ways, um, and uh, because I found ways that were pretty good if, uh, you know, many years ago, I haven't really changed too many of them. Um, so there's probably actually quite a few others that I'm not aware of. Um, so of course there's the Maxent GUI, graphical interface, that was sort of the common and initial way to interact with Maxent. You can also um, simply call that Maxent jar file uh, with a, and script it so that you can kind of make it reproducible. I'll show you an example of that because that's something I used to do uh, a while back. Um, there are a number of packages that implement uh, or run Maxent jar behind the scenes for you and make it easier for you to specify the commands for it. So Dismo is a popular one. Uh, Biomod 2 is popular because it fits Maxent as well as a number of other options. Um, ENM eval is a good option if you want to do some um, cross-validation to estimate what your optimal regularization parameter or other parameters are. Um, MaxNet is also produced by Stephen Phillips and it's, it's a wrapper around GLMNet. And so this is a fully R-based implementation. It doesn't call maxent.jar. And it, um, it's, it's nice because it's super fast um, to, well, it's super fast at certain things. It's not super fast with inch features, um, but it's super fast at certain things. Um, in particular, if you're willing to drill down to GLMNet, um, you can get your optimal regularization parameter estimate. And so that's, that's what I do um, always. Uh, and I'll show you some of the code for how I do that. And so, uh, so these are the spectrum of things that are out there. Um, the two in bold are that this is kind of what I used to do. Um, it's still a perfectly fine thing to do. Maxent.jar is still very fast uh, at most things, and it has a lot of convenience functions where it processes your model in certain ways. So it's still a perfectly good thing to use. Um, although I would recommend highly to script it rather than use the point and click interface just because it's more reproducible. And then GLMNet is, is or, or MaxNet is, is um, I think, the, you know, likely the way going forward. And, and MaxNet is now under the hood in, in an eval from a, the latest release. Um, okay, so the first way that I mentioned doing this, uh, and I mentioned this because I think it's still fast, it does a lot of um, different um, convenience computations for you, is to just use a call to system that pastes together a string. So down at the bottom here, um, I've got a system call in R it pastes together a series of strings. And so these strings are created up here and those are different settings that go to, um, to the maxent jar function. So you have to do things like tell your computer where the maxent jar function is. Um, you have to give it an output directory and that's gonna be a string. Uh, you have to, uh, in this case, I had a series of things related to bias estimated with a target group from a particular data source. So I specified a couple of common settings, which is we don't remove duplicates. Um, we ignore a couple of predictors in here. Um, I had a series of settings that were common to all models in terms of not telling me warnings so that it wasn't popping things up and slowing things down, um, so forth. Specify an environmental directory, specify um, where the data, the presence data reside, and then basically stitch that all together and that will run the Maxent GUI um, behind the scenes for you. And I split it up. You can put all this in one single command, but because I was running a whole bunch of different models, I found it useful to piece these together um, in different ways so I could run 10 different versions and, and only repeat this stuff to the, to the minimum extent possible. Um, I should also point out that the system call works in this way on a Mac. I have no idea if it works on PC, um, but there's probably something pretty closely related if, even if it does involve a few little extra tweaks. Uh, the way that I think most people are likely to use uh, MaxNet going forward is probably with the MaxNet package. And that makes it super easy because you can specify the presences, you can specify the uh, environmental data, and then it just takes care of everything for you. Now, it doesn't do all the things in terms of making predictions and doing response curves and all that other kind of stuff that the GUI does, um, but, uh, you know, it's not super hard to code that up. It'll be a little bit of activation energy to start, but it, you know, builds character. Um, and so, anyway, so this is a convenience thing, but it's important to know what's going on underneath the hood and uh, know what decisions are being made for you. So the defaults in here are set, such as 
following ways where there's a specific way that the formula is created for this regression. There's a specific value of the regularization multiplier, which is set to the, the default that uh, Dudek and Phillips came up with in 2008. And then there's a regularization function that describes what the rules are for, for applying this regularization. And what those look like, you can actually just type in the name of the function, um, and I'm not gonna go through this in detail. Um, but the reason I show you this is because it's also kind of useful to look at the guts of these functions and modify them as you need. So you can look inside the MaxNet formula and you can see what the defaults are for the different number of presences uh, used to, to determine a particular class. And so you can say, oh, well, if there's less than 10 presences, I'm only gonna use the linear model class. If there's less than 15, I'll use linear and quadratic. There's less than 80, I'll use linear, quadratic, and hinge. And if there's even more than that, then I'll use product features as well. And so you can both see what's going on underneath the hood. And um, if you want to just take this function and modify it for your own custom purposes because you don't like these thresholds, it's a perfectly willing thing to do, a reasonable thing to do. Just take the function, uh, rename it, and uh, make the modifications that you like. Um, the other important thing is that there's a single um, regularization parameter and that there's different types of regularization that are used on each uh, feature type. So there's a different regularization parameter used for linear versus hinge features with the idea that you want to penalize hinge features more because they can get more complex. And all of those things are, all of those, those um, default parameters are multiplied by a single regularization parameter. And, um, and that's, that's um, what the usual thing that people think about when they describe the regularization parameter in, in that sense is this regularization, this, I think they call it beta multiplier in the GUI. Um, and so um, you can do all that stuff, um, but it's also, I think, easy to trick a GLM. So I mentioned earlier that we can do this with a weighted GLM. So you can fit these maxent models with, with by down-weighting the presences relative to the background points. See the, see the last lecture where I talked about that, if um, this is something you want to do. And so you can fit this regular old GLM, but the nice thing is that you can also fit it directly with GLM net. And so because GLM net is just a um, GLM that uses uh, lasso regression, uses other types too, but uses lasso regression to constrain your parameters, you can basically, um, without too much code, you define your presences and you define your data, and you have to specify a few things here, which you can draw from the max net function. Um, but you can basically use GLM net directly so that you're specifying everything and MaxNet's not making any decisions for you. Um, this, you might ask, why would I bother to do this if this is all going on behind the scenes? And the reason is that you could use cv.glmnet. And what this does is internally uses cross-validation to select the optimal regularization multiplier. Okay, um, that's, a, that's a very long and complicated sounding sentence, so I'll say that. Um, it internally does cross-validation, so it can help you determine what the optimal value of the regularization multiplier is. You don't have to fit 20 different models. It does it all internally. One of the most amazing things about it is it actually can fit 200 different values of the regularization parameter faster than you can fit a single model um, calling GLMnet by itself. And so what that results in, this is a pr pretty important plot, is we have some estimate of um, model error on this axis, could be mean square error, in this case it's binomial deviance. Um, along here are the regularization parameter values. And so you can see the minimum error occurs right here, at this guy, we looked at one of these plots earlier. And um, the one standard deviation above that, so a simpler model, it's one standard deviation above that, is this guy up here. And basically it tells you that this is called uh, this is this is the optimal value of the regularization multiplier, like negative uh, seven. Oh, you're here to learn about regularization multipliers? All right, that's what I thought. Um, so this is a model, why don't you get down? Why don't you get down? Okay, good job. Um, so this uh, in cv.glmnet is stored as lambda min one SE because it's the minimum lambda one standard deviation or one standard error. Um, from the, the absolute minimum value. And this is the thing that I use for my regularization parameter um, with 
all the time. And I think um, even if you don't want to choose the same rule for doing it, I think it's still a um, it's a it's an important way to, to choose your regularization multiplier to get optimal model complexity. Um, so my recommendations here. Um, all the software options are good if you explore the consequences of using different settings. Some of the different software components make decisions for you, um, either because it's a default or because it's a convenience or because it's a common setting that people often want. Um, and it's, it's just important and it's your responsibility uh, as a scientist to, to dig into those. And um, you know that, that wasn't the paradigm early on in um, Maxent modeling and uh, because the software was so easy to use. And I think it's become a lot better um, in the last decade. Um, and you know, it's just important, you gotta dig into those settings and understand what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so I highly recommend stratified cross-validation to make any of your model decisions. You can use that for um, regularization parameter, but you can also use it to um, choose any tuning parameters related to the model that you're, that you're interested in, in selecting among. Um, it could be variable selection if you want to compare different combinations of variables a priori. Um, there's a very good review on this uh, stratified cross-validation uh, in ecography a few years ago. And uh, I guess the final thing, regardless of which piece of software you use, uh, you want to make sure your code is reproducible. And that's one of the reasons that I advise scripting Maxent stuff rather than using the GUI. Um, it's nice if you want to put these in R markdown files or RMD files. Um, I think it's a nice way to you know, publish papers if you can show your analysis in a markdown file. It both shows the code and it shows the outputs of your code. Um, so sort of your manuscript shows the outputs of your code. A lot of times if people include code, it just includes the raw code and somebody has to go through all the effort of running it. And this is a nice balance because it, it um, produces a document that shows how all the code uh, is used to generate the outputs. And this is a, this is a higher standard of reproducibility that also encourages people to um, you know, evaluate your work and understand your work better. So reproducible code, R Markdown is a, is a great option for doing that. And so with that, um, that's everything I have to say on um, implementation in R. There are lots of options and um, you should suffer through a few of them and um, hopefully you'll, you'll uh, survive and, and come out um, understanding um, how the software works a little bit better. All right. Thanks for paying attention.